Thank you very much. Justine, thank you. Good morning. I'm Christine Hauskeller from Exeter. I'm very glad and thankful to have been invited to actually come to Geneva and spend those three days with you. I'm very sorry I couldn't do that. It is, uh, things came in the way of this, but I'm glad we found a way of at least giving me the opportunity to present some of my latest thinking on the medicalization of psychedelics to you and discuss it with you and hear what you're thinking. It was pointed out to me by Joost Brexma that when I when he saw the title for my talk, he already knew the answer, um, namely that my answer will be no. So I apologize for having chosen a title that actually answers itself. But it might still be worse, I hope, for you to hear the reasons why I think this is the case and why I think we need different ways of finding or creating knowledges and producing evidence regarding what psychedelics may or may not do for us as individuals as well as our societies. So the theoretical starting point that as a philosopher I'm taking and that I will only very briefly throw at you here is a background in critical theory from the Frankfurt School. And the key concepts of that school are summarized here in a somewhat very rude way. But regarding these three how we usually seem to think we can distinguish between knowledge, what we can say about the world and ethics and philosophy. Let me just say that regarding epistemology in critical theory, it is clearly favoring a thinking in constellations of ways in which things hang together rather than disentangling or defining linear causalities. It is very critical of what it calls instrumental reasoning and looks for a thinking that is not instrumental. I will say more about that in the course, all of these in the course of the talk. It is against the reification. That means that we identify things and turn them into goods that are especially interchangeable and fetishized to use uh, Karl Marx's word for it. That means against the commodification and substance fetishism, which we may also apply to psychedelic substances. And then regarding ethics, a key concept that it carries over, critical theory carries over from Hegel through Marx and Freud is alienation um, and the ways in which we are all individualized, which may be connected, I've been arguing elsewhere, to uh, mental health. And that is a widely shared position that a lot of depression, anxiety disorders, um, loneliness, and conditions we suffer from have actually something to do with the way we live now. Um, the culture industry is one element that fosters this, and, and the culture industry is also engaging, of course, with our psychedelic renaissance ongoing. The method that is used is one of imminent critique and this way in which we have norms that we hold high and up, such as equality and liberty and uh, well-being and a good life for the individual that our society is supposed to enable only that it doesn't. And this is the key way in which critique is made in this trad philosophical tradition. So it's the critique, a, a philosophy that critiques the social order and the way it is aimed at possession and control. And this is what I'm going to talk about. One way in which we can look at cl clinical trials through that lens was articulated by Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, and I will read just a couple of sentences from it to say how I come to look at uh, clinical trials as, as a practice. So here, this quote says, representation gives way to universal fungibility. An atom is smashed not as a representative, but as a specimen of matter, and the rabbit suffering the torment of the laboratory is seen not as a representative, but mistakenly as a mere exemplar. Because in functional science, the scientific object is petrified, whereas the rigid ritual of the former times appears supple in its substitution of one thing for another. And here they are talking about the ways in which 
knowledge th through what we call the enlightenment has turned our culture and civilization away from so-called magic. They argue instead that magic, like science, is concerned with ends, but it pursues them through mimesis, not through an increasing distance from the object. It certainly is not founded on, on the omnipotence of thought. So I let this sit with you for a second and then I continue. Applying this to what clinical research might mean in a few minutes going briefly though, through what I'm going to argue. So the war against drugs is harmful and for many psychedelics, it's unjustifiable. We have three semi-legitimized spaces in which psychedelics are quite widely used and have been for a long time. Uh, clinics, churches and parties, festivals or raves. These spaces, and especially science, limit and manipulate psychedelic experiences. And this is what I will expand on at, at, at some length in the talk. Psychedelic experiences are seem, deemed dangerous in Western civilization. Maybe that is because they invite a different ethic, one not of alienation and individualization and being an exemplar, but one of connectedness. But so where do we experience connectedness? If psychedelics have anything to do with experiencing connectedness, where does this better happen, especially when we talk about nature connectedness or uh, in interpersonal connectedness? So the question really is, can evidence against alienation be reconceived in forms that go beyond the methods of individualization, reification, and instrumentalization that I've argued critic characterize medicalization and with it the, the new therapeutic pathways in psychedelics that are widely being developed? So we have these three spaces I've just said the clinic, the party, and the church. In the clinic, we use psychedelics to cure mental illnesses and make people feel or be more normal. Normal meaning fitting into society, going to work, looking after their families and themselves, etc. Not being ill. Then the party where we have experience of self-abandon in a somewhat synchronous crowd. And then the church where we have shared community, ritual, community and rituals and some forms of ecstatic transcendent experiences when we're lucky. I would argue, I have argued that these three spaces are both semi-legal in the sense that they, uh, in church uses, like this, this Santo Daime, for instance, growing everywhere in the uh, Western world, we have permission, to, there is permission to use psychedelics under particular conditions for a particular practice of ritual. In the party, we have a way in which, I mean, parties have been happening for many decades. They're very clearly an industry, a part of the culture industry. They are not something that is illegal and underground. Something that is illegal in a strict sense isn't actually around for 40 years and such a huge industry. That creates a lot of money. And then, of course, the medical uh, community about which I will be mostly talking in this uh, presentation. So clinical settings look like this, maybe this is a photo from the internet. What happens in clinical trials? Let's just jump into this straight away. This is a quote from a clinical trial uh, paper reporting on clinical trial uh, for major depressive disorder with psilocybin. And the key point I want to raise here is the participants position in this, the way in which psychedelics are to be experienced. Participants are lying down in some comfortable space, a sofa or an armchair with a blanket and eye shades and headphones, etc. This is made so that as it says in this quotation from the report, to enhance inward reflection and music was played and participants were instructed to wear eye shades and headphones. So enhance inward reflection, that is the focus in this clinical trial. It is about you being mentally ill, engaging with what is in your head and in your experience to somehow 
reconceptualize and rewrite the story of your past or how you perceive your present life. The music is, that's an example, as you can see from the Johns Hopkins playlist um, from a recent depression study. The music in this playlist is very much geared towards carrying uh, the emotions and state of mind of the participants in a certain choreography. So there is the background when the psilocybin begins to take effect, then there is an ascent, a peak, a post peak, and then a well, come back to earth music. A lot of this, when you look at the longer list, is really quite, uh, it's a very Western list of classical music, a lot of uh, sad music and it's, it's quite an interesting choice, this way in which this is made to be the, the music used in these clinical trials, the sort of bourgeois playlist that we see here of what is seen culture that absolutely avoids anything that has any reminiscence of the hippie era. The point of this playlist is to provide a net of reassurance, almost, of leadership. The music helps keep participants from prematurely returning to normal conscious awareness, Bill Richard says. Who judges what is premature? The majority of the music is either instrumental or choral with no English text and purposefully so. English text, it's quite interesting as if people in such trials or elsewhere wouldn't also speak other languages, but that aside, in order to keep participants inside the experience, only the last selection of, section of the playlist uses recognizable words. And then if you are truly trying to shift consciousness beyond the level of the everyday self, you have to go beyond language. And the way to go beyond language, obviously, is imagery and music. So there's been the study by Galen and colleagues to look at, Galen and colleagues to look at actually the role of music in psychedelic therapy. And they did in a little study with only 19 participants. So this is really quite low numbers. But still the qualitative description and responses that participants fed back are interesting because they included 40% of people saying they were irritated, 50% saying there were phases where there was discomfort, where they were uncomfortable or unpleasant interference with their experience. Six out of 19 said that there was misguidance through the music. It was a mismatch or incongruent with their subjective experience. And about 30% still said the music felt intrusive. They were unable, it didn't actually positively influence a challenging experience, giving a sense of being manipulated. The music was giving a sense of unmet potential so they could have had a more desirable trip experience if there hadn't been this dissonant music that they felt were mani was manipulating they were supposed to feel at a point in time during that process. This is interesting, and it tells us something about the way in which in such clinical trials, inevitably, because we want to create general knowledge about the human responding to psychedelics, human in a particular condition, but sort of as a general human being. So this is a lot about ethics and power, this notion of manipulation or orchestrating the trip experience with the music is not random. We might say, I'm saying here or proposing that maybe in those clinical trials, quite inevitably, patients are perceived as passive exemplars. Trials are a complex endeavor to measure and instrumentalize the immeasurable of psychedelic experiences and the incommensurable that, that is very individual very personal, maybe very cultural too. There's clearly a mass market orientation in bringing these therapies to market. And there, that is what we call a perfect instantiation of instrumental reason. Communal and nature experiences are foreclosed. There's a colonization of the inner mind and the self through that process in which participants are also then encouraged to share their experiences. The substances that are being used too are commodified in 
clinical trials with psilocybin. This is not usually natural substances. This is actually laboratory produced uh, chemicals that can be clearly measured in micro and milligrams. But there is a way in which the substances are also fetishized. So we see all these articles talking about mushroom trials um, with images of actual mushrooms. There is no trial using actual mushrooms. So there is a way in which we fetishize something natural or indigenous practices of use when how this is re reported in the press, whilst the actual use and setting as well as the substance are mass produced chemicals from a laboratory. So there is a paradox. I have explained this paradox in this article referenced below this chapter in our book, Philosophy and Psychedelics, that came out last year, about this paradox of trying to both use as well as control the experience of madness within psychology. There is value in the submission to the new therapy in the patient. The patient who resists actually fully participating is seen as the problem. Also the patient, of course, who doesn't come away with the right kind of improvement of their condition. So there's attempts by uh, Jus and Michiel van Elk, for instance, Jus Brexim and Michiel van Elk, to actually look into this in 2021. They published this article uh, called A Manifesto for Embracing the Weirdness of Psychedelics in which they really talk about quantifying and qualifying mystical experiences, different ways in which we could look at set and setting and cultural context, et cetera. So this is about making these clinical trials better and more directly so is a paper they were both involved with in uh, 2022 on adverse events. Now in clinical trials, adverse events are the very things where people do something that is really harmful to them or where their response to the treatment plan is uh, not as expected, but actually really bad. And that in psychedelics could, for instance, mean feeling discomfort. It could also mean that very depressed people make attempts or actually successfully commit suicide. So adverse events are really important and they look at the reporting of adverse events and find in that in the psychedelic clinical trials, they, those are really underreported, not well defined, etc. There is a way in which the clinical trial is trying as a method in medical science, is trying to square the circle of psychedelics. And in their paper, they give quite a few examples of how one might move forward with that, within that paradigm of knowledge creation on psychedelics. But looking at connectedness, maybe there is something more going on. There are different forms of connectedness we are talking about that are just debated. One is the cosmic or transpersonal connectedness, what we might call a mystical experience. There is social or interpersonal connectedness and there is nature connectedness. The last one will be the focus of my talk in the remaining bit. But first, a little bit on cosmic or transpersonal connectedness. There is an older concept that refers to called the oceanic feeling. Freud discusses that and so does Aldous Huxley. Then we have, of course, the mystical experiences, the mystical experiences questionnaires that are being that are used in the clinical trials to assess the intensity of participant experiences. What does it mean, this feeling one with the cosmos or with the universe? 5-MeO-DMT has been uh, widely lauded as providing the most reliable such um, cosmic or experience of an intense mystical uh, encounter. Peter Schuster-Dews, who works with me here at Exeter, has described this in his chapter in our Philosophy and Psychedelics book on the White Sun of Substance, Spinozism, and the Psychedelic Amor Dei Intellectualis. But psychologically speaking, we could also speak of self-loss or dissociation. Huh? These are experiences from the psychedelic uh, space. There are other experiences too, though, of connectedness, not just with a transpersonal cosmic or mystical uh, mystical experiences, but also concrete, more interpersonal connectedness situations, feeling together with others, the element that uh, the rave draws on more than uh, the ritual practices in churches. So here we have 
we know that indigenous uses of psychedelics are often in such group contexts of a community trying to solve problems and tensions within said community. Then, of course, what I might call non-official uses, uh, when people just take psychedelics in friends groups, and that not as part of a rave, not as part of a church, and not as part of a clinical trial in the sort of illegal underground, which is not so very much underground. Um, this is community use and community experiences. Um, so, we can create or people create, use psychedelics to create or intensify community experiences, but often that requires a setting that is already a good group in the sense of free from sexual, gender, racial or other violence and hostilities. This is one of the big issues raised by some colleagues such as Nidia Devino and others regarding a lot of retreat experiences where actually such safe environments are not provided. So it requires a certain basic understanding of uh, the ethics of community or group to actually create a better group experience in such contexts. But it is noteworthy to look at Leah Rosemann and colleagues work regarding the use of ayahuasca, for instance, to foster inter-ethnic understanding uh, between Israeli, Israelis and Palestinians. And there's ongoing and new group research projects in Exeter starting as well as elsewhere. So this group element in psychedelics is starting to be picked up. The Even the psychological field is trying to find ways of integrating this differently, moving away from that setting I've just shown you with a couch and the eye shades and the headphones and just one person being the patient and two people sitting there making sure they don't freak out. Now, nature relatedness, the last one of the three forms of connectedness. In psychology, it's a measure for the connection to nature, including emotional, experiential and actionable qualities. So nature relatedness is just a standard term. Nature relatedness in philosophy may be linked to and is often linked to environmentally responsible behavior. Uh, there is thinking about ecological identity, the relations to selves, non-humans and entire ecosystems and the work, for instance, uh, of Aninez. Feminist philosophers have engaged very differently with the category of nature somewhat criticizing it as a chaotic concept or as a stigmatizing concept when opposed to culture. But we also see discussions of culturally specific representations of nature. That means when we talk to people about what they understand nature to be, and this is the point I'm getting to next, uh, we find there is quite a range of ways in which people actually use that term and concept of nature from nature could be represented by a single plant in a clinical environment to actually being in the Amazon rainforest. Um, within the psychological teams and psychedelics, these signs of connectedness and environmental behavior has become quite prominent in recent years. So Ketner and colleagues write that the psychedelic experiences could actually increase nature relatedness and that this was an important advancement on the correlative association observed between amount of lifetime psychedelic use and nature relatedness in previous studies. So the more psychedelic experiences people had, the more nature related they presented uh, when being asked about it in the context of clinical trials or research. There's a meta-analysis by Whitburn and colleagues who say that the interventions designed to facilitate a stronger connection to nature may result in greater engagement in pro-environmental behavior. Now, this is not a meta-analysis of psychedelic clinical trials. This is a meta-analysis generally of, the, of psychology and other, all sorts of interventions that could uh, look at pro-environmental behavior. So there is, a, however, a correlation they find, not a causation. So it might well be, they say, that people who participate in more pro-environmental behavior may develop a stronger connection to nature. But it could be that a stronger connection to nature 
motivates greater pro-environmental behavior. So if we have people being connected better to nature or saying that they feel better connected to nature, they might be better in terms of protecting uh, the climate, for instance, or in other environmental behavioral everyday choices we make. So can psychedelics help against alienation? Kettner and colleagues argue that yes, reconnecting humans with nature and healing the apparently growing sense of alienation from it should be considered a common and urgent priority area for humanity. So in order to prospect, protect species and the biosphere, it would be good to actually increase nature relatedness and if psychedelics help us do this, maybe that is what we should do. So, however, I've said that in clinical trials, there is this direction to the inward that actually nature relatedness there is not in engaging with an actual nature. It's not nature experiences. It's a very imaginary nature connectedness. Because the attention is directed inwards in this sort of settings, what appears as nature that you might feel connected to are the images of nature or fantasies of nature that we might have cultivated in our particular little heads. So there is no physical touching, smelling or seeing nature differently. The famous example Huxley describes when looking at the rose. This is not how these clinical trials function because it's all about directing participants inwards to their mind and consciousness. So it is an imaginary connectedness that such a setting produces. And the question is, does this actually work? Does an imaginary connectedness then create this pro-environmental behavior that is so celebrated? So if we only validate these inner processes in these sanitized inner trips, as we do in a clinical setting, that may both reduce the ethical importance of the experience as well as limit this life-changing quality of the experience. Now we have lots of actually sensory material, sensual material that is being produced in the psychedelic space. That is, for instance, these images of nature, plants, forests, animals, animated life objects entangled and grown into one another. There is reporting of intense experiences within and of nature in trip reports. Uh, also of nature outside. And I will speak about this a very little bit. I've been doing a, a project with a student here at Exeter who interviewed um, other students uh, on use of psychedelic mushrooms indoors and outdoors and how they felt about it. And it was quite interesting this way in, in the context of uh, looking at nature connectedness and this way in which that might actually change behavior and attitudes to nature. So whilst nature is a diffuse term, this way in which people felt nature related was really key. So we found that feelings of nature connection relate to the pre-existing opinions about nature, to being physically outdoors during the trip, the intention a participant had for the trip and the intensity of the trip experience. And just to report two slides now on findings, Cyril was lying in a field when insects began to crawl all over him. He contemplated panicking because of his fear of spiders. But then he thought, I'm in their home. I'm lying in their home. It felt like that neural pathway was sort of seared into existence. This changed his experience and led him to continue to treat bugs with respect during his trip and since then, and he says, I don't kill insects anymore. Cyril had direct physical encounter with insects during his trip, which he attributes to his changed thinking as well as behavior towards, in this case, the crawlies. There's another quote from this uh, study. The universe is one substance and we are just one aspect of that. There's no longer that separation. It's one thing to conceptually read about it. But what I believe is that what I saw during a trip is roughly analogous to that. Now everything I interact with, animals, plants, even things that you could say are inanimate, I treat with kindness and empathy. 
So Walter came to change to a change in his core values, and this in turn altered his behavior. He says the breakdown of the separation of individual and collective creates the conditions for action, showing communalism, a reaction of the separation of nature and society and a desire to work with nature and not for it. So it was quite interesting, this little study with, with these uh, 14 students and just what they reported on their intentions for trips and the comparison between in and outdoors. Herbert Marcuse, of course, wrote on this famously, as many of you will already know, that he says psychedelics are certainly uh, not <clears throat> a means to entirely cause a revolution, but they can change a revolution in perception. And this revolution in perception, the awareness of the need for such a revolution in perception for a new sensorium is perhaps the kernel of truth in the psychedelic search and how it might lead towards actually liberation and the more radical social revolution that he thinks are needed. So, liberty and encounters with what is not self. That means playlists and other manipulation such as stand in attention with self-chosen experiments in ethical and health work on the self with others. If respect for nature is desired, psychedelics might provide helpful experiences in multisensory encounters with what is outside, not just what is already somehow inside one's mind. There is a, a quote for this from Luis Le, uh, Eduardo Luna's paper, Indigenous and Mestizo Use of Ayahuasca, where he says, according to Gebhard Sayer, the shaman ascends to higher realms where he listens to the melodies from the spirits and sings with them. Those songs have a visual manifestation that the women transmit in their art. The Shipibo believe their bodies are covered by invisible designs. Illness is the disruption of the pattern and the song of the shaman restore their order and beauty. Healing is thus an aesthetic endeavor. While doing field work in Santa Rosa de Piroca, a Shipibo settlement by the Ukayali River, I asked Don Basilio Gordon, a shaman, about the plants he used to heal his patients. He said that it is enough to know the songs of the plants to be able to cure. The plants are needed only if you do not know their songs. So how do we learn the songs of the plants? If alienation, psychedelics and connectedness have something to do with each other, then the, the danger that leads to the criminalization and the very uh, discarding of such unnormal, all sorts of unnormal experiences in our society as illnesses or madness. The danger of such experiences might lie in a sensory, sensory revolution and actual ethical change that they might be engendered. Clinic, church and festival don't facilitate such change. They are particular islands within society for release or for transcendence, for making you fit into the everyday world and its expectations. That in that they are quite different from self-determined, self-chosen practices that are in a self-chosen environment where you are not just part of a big group or serve a higher purpose or part of a medical experiment to make you feel better about yourself. So self-realization self -realization, respect for nature and other life are connected as some of this research, uh, the previous slides have argued. And that means I think we should aim for decriminalization of psychedelics to enable new ways of connectedness and the development of an ethics of care. Such an ethics of care would mean empathy and intuition, no playlists, no eye shades, nor enforced passivity embodied situations which enable sensual active experiences, engaging with others such as peoples, plants and animals, and of course resisting colonization of substances and ways of achieving personal or group ends. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Christine. Um, we will now of course also here have a Q&A session. Um, our colleague in the back will 
make her now, Christine, a big screen so we can interact a bit more easily. And the only special thing about this Q&A is that Christine cannot hear directly whatever someone asks through the microphone. So we have someone in the back that basically repeats the question to her. And that means that questions please have to be very yeah, short material and concise. So please, as you formulate or think about your question, as concise as possible. That means no trip reports of five minutes <laughs> introducing the question. Um, so really, please, let's have it concise so we don't use anything in translation. OK. Microphone is already running. Thank you, Christina, for that um, interesting talk. I wonder if you have uh, empirical or personal first-hand experiences of the clinical trials that uh, you're discussing. I see a wealth of research, but um, have you made the personal experience yet? Uh, I have never been a participant in a clinical trial. And there are a lot of my, my colleague, uh, Professor Celia Morgan here at Exeter, who was earlier affiliated with David Nutt and the Imperial team, is running quite a number of trials at Exeter. Uh, so we have lots of discussions about this, but no, I've not been participating myself in a trial, nor have I so far actually conducted participatory observation research or something like that in the trial. I have spoken to a lot of people, however, who do them, or did similar kind of work. I'm not sure what the... There is a wider question coming with that. Why, I, why should I have done that? <laughs> it's the question that the criticism isn't legitimate, because, I mean, I know that many of the people who run the clinical trials actually struggle with what they have to do in order to fit into that scientific paradigm that they are required to work within in order to actually get the kinds of approvals that they think they need. So there is a sort of, the awareness isn't just mine, it's actually very widespread within the psychological community that does the trials, that there are problems. That's why I quoted quite a few of the papers who actually struggle or, or fight at the corners of this process with different evidence regimes, I from Leo Rosemann to Ketna, et cetera. I don't disagree that this might be the experience of very many participants. However, having had the uh, opportunity and privilege to actually have been a participant on one of the trials that was featured earlier today, I have to say that it did not reflect my experience at all. And so this is why I was wondering maybe possibly these um, these papers are based on, let's say, different trials, previous trials, possibly our perception has since changed? Um, so has the percep is your perception not this perception I've described? Because what I've been trying to describe is the way in which trials have to standardize the setting in which the patient comes in. Uh, so that they don't have to have many parameters that could have influenced the experience. That's why you have headphones and eye shades, so that actually visual and acoustic disturbances don't disrupt the experience so that it's more comparable. This is, but also to really direct people inward. And if you are, I, my point is not to say that the clinical research is illegitimate, and it is not to say that psychedelics cannot or shouldn't be used to help people who are severely mentally ill. I do, however, think that if we see this as the path in which psychedelics could be accessible in a society that otherwise limits access and actually crim criminalizes possession, this is wrong, A, because you have to be severely mentally ill to have access, and B, because there are so many other ways, such as connectedness experiences, that psychedelics 
could be helpful for people outside the diagnostic parameters within, within which these clinical trials operate. Thank you. Um, just a little request by our uh, translator in the back to ask the questions r very slowly because he's translating or repeating simultaneously. Yeah, just as a side note. There are two questions in the back. Hello, thanks for your talk. Uh, so my question uh, will be short and simple. Um, uh, is the, the experience uh, that the sitters uh, have of uh, psychedelics a part of your ethical consideration? Actually, I do think that this is the case. I mean, it's actually very important. Now, the sitter, it's, it's a question which kind of sitter that is. I've personally participated in a holotropic breathwork workshop, where, as you may know, the practice is that from the participants, you are sort of in, grouped in pairs, and you are sitting through the trip of someone else, uh, being there just for them as a sitter. So it's not a professional relationship. It's not somebody who's trained to be a sitter. It was me sitting for someone else who I didn't know before, um, but being there for them for four or five hours for simple things, not the more elaborate body work or anything, just being there to make sure that if they needed water, needed to go to the toilet, needed a break, needed a, a arm to squeeze, th there was immediately someone there, in that case me. So a, a labor of love, which is what it is. It's the kind of thing you usually do for sick children, sick parents, or sick friends. It's not something you do for anyone you never met. You don't do it at all. We don't sit and look at somebody for four hours. Um, it would be weird being in that space with the music, with all the events happening around you. And actually, just with one job, being there for this person, it's a very rare thing. We are very rarely ever forced to do. And it is a massive ethical encounter, I found. I found that probably as intense as the trip experience itself, which was great. Um, but the... So I, this is another thing about the substance. Maybe we need to move away from the substance paradigm, which of course the clinic can't do when it comes to psychedelic experiences. Maybe we, we need to discuss differently than always just about different drugs and how much of it is enough for what. Um, that there might be other ways of thinking about uh, the ways in which we use our consciousness and engage with it. And I found that sitting experience in this holotropic breathwork workshop really a, a, a very good ethics thing, and I'm actually writing about that with two colleagues, that this is a key factor of ethics of care and of learning to care. Hello, Christine. Uh, thank you, as always. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to hear my voice and the speed at which I normally talk soon. Um, but I really enjoy the facet that you explained of the three sectors in which we now experience psychedelics um, and how you said that these are isolating experiences in many ways in which we return inward. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak more to how we can find different dynamics where people can do this inward reflection of somewhat of a hermitage style, but then also have the dynamic of being in larger settings, such as festivals, and having a more healing, connected experience with multiple people uh, in a safer and more ethical way. I mean, this is the whole point about decriminalization. Which is actually a very entangled thing. I've been looking at this for a couple of years with colleagues in a hybrid research group we've formed, and it's actually much quite difficult to re to think what you mean with it. In different countries, it means something different. There's a lot of other practices from legalization, etc., that you would then need to consider. This is actually 
a, a, a huge bureaucratic bubble that opens up as soon as you think, uh, realize decriminalization is more than saying, okay, nobody's get penalized for having this stuff. It's actually much more difficult. But it, it matters to do that so that you actually get out of this, the culture industry of the rafe, maybe in a way the culture industry of the churches, and into and, and of course the medicalization factor that has its own pharmaceutical complex attached to it, into ways in which uh, psychedelic experiences can be enjoyed. And I don't think there is a wrong way for different people, different ways might be the right ways, and maybe everybody could use different ways anyway and benefit from them. Uh, there isn't one right experience, not for one person and not for the world. So I think what needs to happen is an, a more open and uh, transparent discussion of the potential of such experiences and how they can be enabled um, across the board. There's nothing wrong with people joining a church. There's nothing wrong with going to a rave. It's just that these are very peculiar, uh, strict confines of event. And we need to move beyond that. I think the psychologists who work now with group experiences, and there's quite a bit going on in Exeter as well as elsewhere, as also with trying to open up the space in terms of uh, maybe going outdoors or at least avoiding the eye shade stuff and thinking about other sensory modalities such as smell. I've been in one location for a clinical trial, which was a former operating theater. And the smell of the operating theater chemicals was such that it actually traumatized me almost. It was like, oh my God, I really wouldn't want to have a trip in there. It was, wow. The medics didn't smell it. That was interesting too. Either they don't have COVID or I don't know. They are immune to it. But so it shows the, in, the way in which our sensory repertoire is so much part of certain setting that including this on the one hand provides richness, it is also something where you can immediately see why the clinic needs to control it or wants to control it. But for a richer engagement with nature and others and life, I think we definitely need uh, to open up that space. We will have one last question. Uh, the microphone Thank is over. You. Thank you for your very stimulating talk. You mentioned an example of someone who's ethical values around killing insects changed after a psychedelic trip. I was wondering if you see any other potential for psychedelics to change people's ethical values and how reliable those effects are and if we are dealing with substances that can change people's ethical values if you see any potential for misuse. Um. Leo Rosemann now works with me in Exeter, and if you have read his papers on working, using ayahuasca to work in groups with Palestinian and Israeli people, and then you read today's news, this is definitely didn't work. But of course, this was more groups of maybe 20, 30 people uh, that actually ever experienced this sort of as a very much reconnecting and a, a way in which you could overcome this sort of traumatic condition with, within which these two people were thrown uh, with and against each other. Um, and this way in which maybe there is potential, but whether that needs the drug <laughs> is an interesting question, whether there is this, the willingness to change might be as important. One key thing from this study with the students and which many other people have been reporting is that the actually preparedness, the set, <laughs> in which a person uses a drug or goes into a psychedelic experience or seeks it out, is really important for what they experience. So if somebody isn't ready to change, then you can go to 500 raves and come out the same person, maybe worse, <laughs> after 10 years than before. Uh, there is no natural process to make people automatically better. They have to want to be different in order to change. But maybe that preparedness is something that can be increased through experiences in which one for once not feels alienated uh, and lonely and sort of thrown back at oneself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine.
Thank you for the questions. Thank you.